Hey guys, I'm back. It's been a while since I filmed a video. Took a little hiatus there, but some time off in between videos helped me to sort of get inspired and think about cool stuff to talk about. So I'm back today because I have some awesome stuff in flower and I have sort of like a new orchid project, something I've never tried before. So I'm excited to tell you a bit about that. So I have a lot to get through. Let's get started. Okay guys, up first, I have a very exciting orchid to show you guys. This is a Cymbidium, of course. This is Cymbidium Butterball. And it's not all the time that I have a Cymbidium in bloom, so I'm excited to show it off to you guys. But I'm particularly happy to show this one to you because it is one of the easiest ones to grow as a home grower. A lot of people are turned off of growing Cymbidiums because a lot of them get quite big. They need pretty bright light and many of them need a pretty drastic temperature dip in order to set spikes. So for all those reasons, they can be a bit challenging, but there are a few warmer growing cymbidiums that are a bit easier to bloom, and this is one of them. I do have some of the cooler growing ones, and they're tough because I leave them out in the winter into like the low 40s, sometimes even a bit colder, and a few of them won't spike until they get about that cold, so obviously that can be challenging. But the Cymbidium Butterball here spends all year round indoors under my LEDs, and it bloomed without me doing anything special for it. My grow space does get a bit cooler in the winter, even though it's indoors, it's not particularly well heated in this area, so it can dip a bit. But even at its coldest, my grow space doesn't get very cold, it's indoors under lights. I would make sure you can give it some amount of cooling, but Nothing drastic, nothing like other cymbidiums. If your grow space gets a little bit cooler in the winter, kind of like the way you can put a fowl in like a chilly window or something to get it to spike, I think this is more akin to that than other cymbidiums that, you know, need to go down to like the 40 degree area. So um, definitely give this one a try. Also, it's way more compact than other Cymbidiums. The flowers are gorgeous. That greenish gold color is awesome with that dark maroon kind of red in the lip. It's super cool and I'm so happy to have it. Up next here is one of my favorite little compact Cattleyas. This is Cattleya Chien Ya Champion Red Apple. And I'm just obsessed with the color on this thing. It's not quite red, but it's not really like purple either. It's just this awesome kind of like reddish magenta color. It's so striking. And the petals have like a really cool kind of like velvety texture to them. And the shape of the flowers is just like perfect in my opinion. I like sort of a nice simple shaped Cattleya because the color is so interesting. I kind of like that the shape is a bit more simple and you can kind of just appreciate the color without too many frills on it. But there still is a bit of nice detailing in the lip. It's just perfect. It's got Wakariana in its heritage, which doesn't surprise me. I think that's why I like it so much. It has some things in common with it. It's just perfect. It's got a mild fragrance to it. I will just always love this thing. Sometimes it gets a little abused. I've had like pests in the past and stuff, but no matter what happens, it always still blooms and blooms pretty beautifully. So if you are looking for a nice compact Cattleya with really striking flowers that blooms a couple times a year, this is a good one. It checks all the boxes. Up next here is my Ludicia Discolor, which of course is one of the jewel orchids. See the really cool foliage there? Ludicia is actually a monotypic genus, so Discolor is the only one. And as you can see, mine is in spike, uh, but jewel orchids don't have the showiest flowers as far as orchids go, uh, but they make up for it with their foliage. They're so cool looking. They look really amazing when they get nice and big. So as you can see, nice, cool, colored, velvety foliage. I keep mine a bit brighter than I need to, so it looks a little washed out. It's actually quite easy growing, especially for a jewel orchid. Some of them are a lot more sensitive to things like water quality and humidity and stuff, so the Ludicia discolor is definitely the easiest one to start out with. And you kind of just grow it like a houseplant, honestly. You keep them pretty moist because they are a terrestrial type orchid, but I still use a pretty chunky mix just because it's always good to use something that drains pretty well. But 
you definitely want to pot them in something that's going to stay pretty moist for you. And they're a bit low light, but if you want good coloration and good blooming and stuff, of course, it's always good to try experimenting with the light, but they don't need it terribly bright. And yeah, it's just super cool. I hope to grow it out nice and big. They look really awesome when they fill out a bit, so pretty stoked to have it. Up next here is a really nice miniature Latoria dendrobium called Dendrobium Chocolate Chip. And as you can see, it has that very classic Latoria dendrobium shape to the flowers. They have sort of like a winged appearance with those long uh, petals there. And the cool speckling and the nice little veining on the lip. There's a lot of nice uh, detail on these flowers. Some of the other Latoria dendrobiums can be quite big. This one's nice because it's pretty compact and that's a lot of flowers for such a small plant. Even some of these old little growths here have buds on them. So you really do get a lot of flowers uh, for the real estate and they're pretty easy growing. They don't need a winter rest. I tend to cut back on water and fertilizer just in general for most of my orchids in the winter. Other than that, they're really not fussy and they bloom their heads off. Pretty cool little dendrobium, very happy to have it. It's got a bit of a fragrance, but it's sort of like neither here nor there. It doesn't smell like much. It just has a bit of like a waxy kind of like cosmetic smell. Let's go ahead and move on. I actually have the parent orchid in flower as well. So it seems fitting to check that one out next. Up next here is the extremely cute and tiny Den Aberans. We'll take a closer look at it in a second, but I did want to show you a little family photo first. Here is Den Aberans alongside Den Chocolate Chip. This is one of the parents of Chocolate Chip, and this is what is usually used to miniaturize these Latoria type dendrobiums. This is a good opportunity to talk about back crosses in case you've heard that term but wasn't sure what it meant. What happens is you get a hybrid and when you go to breed that again, you take that hybrid and cross it back with one of its own parents. So what happens is you end up with like 75% of a certain orchid in the heritage instead of just half and half, which is really useful when you're trying to bring out a desirable trait in a hybrid. This here is a back cross, so it has the Den Aberans in it twice, if that makes sense. Again, this is a Latoria type dendrobium. Uh, they don't really need a winter rest, but like I said, I do uh, keep them slightly drier in the winter. Den Aberans, actually likes to be kind of more moist overall, especially when it's actively growing. Most Latoria dendrobiums do like a good amount of water, but definitely let them dry between. Aberrant seems to not need it quite as bright as some other dendrobiums. I have noticed some kind of spotting and stuff on the leaves, but most dendrobiums are prone to leaf issues like that anyway. Some of the older bulbs will drop leaves and stuff. It's kind of not a huge deal. Other than that, I don't do anything too special for it, and it just has these adorable little flowers. Some people say it's fragrant. I haven't smelled anything on it, but who knows. There it is, really cute, really happy to have it. Awesome little miniature dendrobium. Up next here is something really cool. Nothing, but it's something. I decided to get my hands on some native terrestrial orchids. Here in New England, I'm in Massachusetts, we do have a handful of native orchids and I finally decided to try my hand at growing them. I don't know why I didn't try this sooner. I do rent, I live in an apartment right now, so I don't wanna plant things in the backyard. That was part of my hesitation, but I decided I was sick of waiting because it's gonna be a little while before I have a home and a garden. So I thought I would try them in a container. I am trying out Cyperpidium acol, which is a North American kind of temperate orchid species. It is of course terrestrial and Cyperpidiums are uh, like a hardy lady slipper orchid and they're really cool and it's just really exciting 
to think about growing orchids outside year round <laughs> where I live because it gets very, very cold. Um, Cyperpidiums, most of them uh, like to get really nice and cold in the winter and die back entirely. They like to be in the hard frozen ground in the winter. <laughs> so it's a bit tricky to grow them in a pot. I would put it outside somehow, um, but maybe sort of cover it or something. I'm still sort of researching that. So I'm not an expert yet, but I will keep you guys posted and let you know how it goes. Uh, but Cyperpidium acol is really cool looking and I partially blame my orchid obsession on the cyperpidiums because I actually saw one in the wild when I was a really young kid and it just totally stole my heart and I've been obsessed with orchids ever since. So I'm surprised it took me this long to finally bite the bullet and get some. I got them sort of just spur of the moment. I found an Etsy seller that had them pretty cheap. You usually get them as just like roots with like a little rhizome. Um, there was like three or four of them. They looked pretty good. They looked like they had started sprouting already as they would this time of year. They bloom in like pretty early spring and then die back over the summer until the fall where they go totally dormant and then do it all again next spring. So I'm not 100% sure if this will bloom for me this spring. I would love it if it would. We will see. This is definitely going to be a learning experience for me and I'm super excited to be trying it. And then hopefully one day, once I have a bigger yard and a garden, I can have a whole plot of all different types of hardy orchids. All right, guys, we're getting ready to wrap things up. Thank you for sticking through this video with me. I know it was probably kind of long, but I'm gonna finish on a high note per usual. I have a couple Angrecoids in flower, which I'm super excited to talk about. This here is my Rangus biloba. I won't go into too much detail about this because it was already in bloom and I talked about it in a previous video, but the one of the existing spikes put out like a new flush of buds on them, which is kind of cool. I didn't really realize it did that. That was an exciting surprise and it looks wonderful alongside my Angraecum germanianum. It grows and blooms so well for me and I don't do anything special for it. It's got like three buds on the way right now and just as I was getting ready to film this, I discovered that even some of these lower like secondary growths have buds, which I was really surprised to see those going into spikes so small. So it has this kind of crazy growth habit. Some Angrecoids have sort of like a vining type tendency, almost like a vanilla. So they benefit from being up against some type of trellis or like moss pole. Mine probably would be in better shape if I provided it that type of setup. It puts out a lot of aerial roots and it likes to sort of be up against something, which I haven't done yet. I bought some moss poles and I'm just waiting for it to maybe finish flowering before I mess around with it too much. Here, I just wanted to try giving you a slightly different angle here. There are just these really cool kind of spidery wispy flowers with a nice big broad lip and they're non recipient meaning that they're sort of upside down like that which gives it that really cool sort of jellyfish squid octopus appearance which i love so much it's an angrecoid so it's nighttime fragrant which is awesome i'm so happy it does so well for me i don't feel like I do anything too special for it and it still blooms pretty well for me. I think it has a reputation as being kind of tough. I think they're slightly cooler growing than some other Angraecums, so maybe that's why people shy away from them. But I still don't think they're terribly temperature sensitive. I think they just grow at like slightly higher altitudes. I would still recommend giving them a try. It's pretty easy growing for me and they're a bit easier to get your hands on these days, so why not give it a shot? It's so cool looking. Okay, that's the wrap, you guys. Thank you so much for watching. Please subscribe if you haven't yet. It's always really exciting when people subscribe to my channel. It never gets old. I always get super stoked to see you guys subscribing and engaging with my content and leaving me comments and all that stuff. Maybe hit the like button, subscribe, leave me a comment. All that stuff is really appreciated. It never goes unnoticed. So thank you guys so much for that. And I'll be back soon. I have more stuff I could talk about, but I don't want to keep you here all day. So I'll save some stuff for the next one and I'll talk to you soon. Bye.